So good evening all. A very warm welcome to another informative session of webinar series from Vijaya Diagnostic Center. Uh, myself, Dr. Lata Galate. I'm a consultant microbiologist and quality manager at Vijaya Diagnostic Center. Uh, today we will be discussing about the basic of dermatopathology. Uh, um, as we are all aware that various skin diseases mimic or have overlapping morphological microscopic picture, it is very important to reach a particular diagnosis for better treatment and successful treatment of a patient. So for that, we should be aware of the basics of the dermatopathologies. So it's very important to have a proper collaboration between dermatopathologists and dermatologists. To throw the light on the same topic, basic of dermatopathologist, we have our subject expert, Dr. Sudhir Babu, who is a consultant pathologist at Vijay Diagnostic Center. Uh, Dr. Sudhir Babu has done his MD in pathology and PDCC in renal and transplant path. Uh, he has total 13 national international publication and 18 presentation to his account. Uh, he has been awarded a diploma in RCPAT in 2019 and he has been awarded first prize in glass side challenge session uh, at New Delhi in 2019. Uh, his area of interest are nephropathology, dermatopathology and lympho. So without uh, doing much delay, I will I would like to hand over the se to the session to the Dr. Sudhir Babu. Dr. Sudhir Babu, over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the warm introduction. Uh, a very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone. Let me begin by commencing. I'll, uh, I want to specially thank our organization, Vijay Diagnostic Center, for giving this wonderful opportunity to speak on this educational platform. Today's lecture is intended to make sure that you will know how to read a skin biopsy slide at the end of it. Initially, we'll discuss about what happens in the lab when you send a biopsy, and then we'll focus mainly on the normal skin histology, along with identification of the inflammatory cells. After that, a brief approach to the skin biopsy slide, and we discuss few cases depicting the various reaction patterns. Let us begin with an interesting fact, historical fact. Can anyone guess this uh, person? He was a French dermatologist, Ernest Besnier, who first introduced the term biopsy. So it was a dermatologist who introduced the term biopsy. Bios life opsis means to see. He wanted to look at the lesional skin by doing a biopsy. So for that, if you want to look at it, you need to cut the tissue and cut into thin slices, keep it on a slide, stain it, and then visualize under the microscope. But by the time you do all these things, the tissue gets decomposed. So the first step is to preserve the tissue, which is done with the help of formin. Now remember, when you take the biopsy bit and keep it in the formin container, make sure that it doesn't have the blood. If you see blood in it, kindly transfer to another clean formin container because blood will hinder the process of fixation. Afterwards, another important thing about the formin is that you need to have a 10% formin rather than the concentrated one which you get from the vendors. And the pH has to be adjusted around 7. So it has to be a 10% neutral formin. And the neutral pH can be achieved with the help of adding phosphate buffers. Then the tissue is subjected for tissue processing with the help of alcohol, xylene, and paraffin wax. Here, just remember that alcohol is being used in the tissue processing because it has an effect on the microscopic appearances, which we will discuss later on. With the help of paraffin wax, we will prepare the paraffin block by keeping the tissue within it. And with that, we can make thin slices of the tissue and then keep it on the slide. And that slide will be stained with hemtoxylin and eosin more commonly. And these are those sections. That's how it all starts in the report. We'll write section studied show, which means all these three sections were studied. And these sections show the following features. Now that the slide is ready, we need a microscope. 
This is a microscope with the four different objectives. I mean, some may have five objectives, mainly four in majority of the scopes. Starting with scanner view, that is 4x objective. The main function is to identify the section when you keep it under the microscope. Identify the section by scanning the slide. So it is a scanner view. After identifying the section, we go to the low power view, that is 10x objective. And here we will assess the pattern of injury or which area is predominantly involved. Then we go to the 40x higher power lens, wherein we will see the cellular detail properly. And finally, we also look into the oil immersion, mainly for acid first bacilli identification. The slide is ready and we try to keep it under the microscope. When you keep it under the microscope, mainly you see two colors, pink, eosinophilic, technically, and blue, basophilic. Pink is because of Eosinstein, blue because of Hematoxylinstein. Now, please do remember at this point of time that blue color will be taken up by the nucleus. So whenever you see blue color, think of nucleus. And the pink color will be taken up by the cell cytoplasm. In a cell, you will see pink cytoplasm, blue nucleus. In addition, remember, pink is also taken up by the keratin as well as collagen. With this knowledge in background, let us look at the normal skin biopsy slide. This is a normal skin biopsy slide. You can see on the top, blue color layer, the epidermis, because it has more keratinocytes, so more nuclei, so the predominant color is blue. And the dermis is mainly pink because it has collagen, so pink color. Subcutis, it doesn't have anything. The adipocytes will show lipids, but these get dissolved in the alcohol, which is used in the tissue processing. So you just see the white light, which is being used in the light microscope. Epidermis, dermis, and subcutis. Now the epidermis, it is called stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified because it has layers of cells and squamous because these keratinocytes, they look like scales. They are looking like fish scales. So that's why they kept the name squamous cells. Stratified squamous epithelium is the epidermis. Within the epidermis, we see mainly five layers starting from the bottom, stratum basale, then thicker spinosum, then blue color granulosum, then acellular stratum lucidum and corneum layers. Now, focus on the basal layer here. These basal keratinocytes have the proliferative potential. Only these cells have the proliferative potential. And here multiplication occurs and they go upwards. Here, they start differentiating, which means acquiring new functions within the spinous layer and then they go still further upwards, acquiring some more functions. Here, the most important differentiation step is that these keratinocytes in the granular layer, they are showing dark blue colored granules. Why? Because they have trichohyaline and filigrin granules. It is these granules which help in extrusion of the nuclei from the corneal layer. When the keratinocytes reach the corneal layer, these granules will extrude the nucleus from there. In addition, there are no cytoplasmic constraints as well because in this corneal layer, lipids are high in number and again, these get dissolved in the alcohol used in the tissue processing. So the most important thing to remember is that because of granular layer, we are able to see the extrusion of nucleus. Now let us start with the appearances of the basal layer. The lowermost layer of the epidermis is the basal layer. And within this basal layer cells, you can see brown color pigment. Can you appreciate these brown color caps? That is a melanin pigment located on the top and it is commonly called melanin cap so that it can protect the nuclear contents from the direct sunlight damage. In addition, if you observe, they have undulating appearances. The basal layer cells, if you form a line, undulating appearance is there and this is a reti ridge. And you can also identify one vacuolated cell within this basal layer, that is the melanocyte. So sometimes uh, in the beginning, you might confuse this as a vacuolar degeneration as well. So please be careful. So in the basal layer, you will see melanin pigment, melanin cap, and you can appreciate the reti ridges and a melanocyte. Now, 
what is the most important thing to discuss about the basal layer whether it is preserved or not in this picture you can see the basal layer properly i mean there is clear cut distinction between the epidermis and dermis but on the right side the basal layer is disturbed blurred completely see that left side is normal right side is blurred now if you look closely there are inflammatory cells as well normal and abnormal so this case comes under lichenoid reaction pattern so focus on basal layer you can see whether lichenoid reaction pattern is present or not and also you can see the necrotic keratinocytes damaged keratinocytes in addition can you notice this melanin pigment here the brown colored melanin pigment within the dermis which means the basal layer cells got damaged and the melanin pigment came into the upper part of the dermis this is called pigment incontinence so with the basal layer identify the reaction pattern now going to the upper layer that is the spinous layer prickle cell layer the name is mainly because of the intercellular bridges in between the keratinocytes you see this keratinocyte and in between the keratinocytes you can appreciate the intercellular bridges because of that it got the name spinosum layer and these are nothing but desmosomes and in this picture you also focus on the cytoplasm pink color and nucleus blue color with the nucleolus dot like blue within the nucleus now in the spinous layer you have to say whether there is acanthosis or there is thinning or normal in thickness there is no specific criteria such that like uh, if you have this much number of uh, layers we can say that is normal generally they say 6 to 7 layers of keratinocytes are noted means it is normal in this picture you can appreciate that it is way more than 6 to 7 more than 15 or 20 layers so definitely there is acanthosis look at the spinous layer and note down whether acanthosis is present or not and if you see spaces in between the keratinocytes then you can comment that there is spongiosis here there are so many spaces look at the previous picture no spaces at all so much of space in between the keratinocytes so this is spongiosis sometimes these spaces coalesce to form large spongiotic vesicle when that is noted you need to think of irritant contact dermatitis moving on to the next layer that is the dark blue colored granular layer this granular layer the color is because of trichohalin and filaggrin granules and just within a slide just say whether granular layer is preserved or not here it is preserved and it is easily appreciated because of the coarse granularity and the color in addition when you see the granular layer and it is forming and if it is in the form of a straight line then it's fine but like in this picture if you focus there is undulating appearance with if you focus on the granular layer then you can say in the report that there is epidermal papillomatosis so papillomatosis comment can be done by looking at the granular layer not on the basal layer and look at this thickened granular layer hypergranulosis in chronic scratching conditions in itching conditions you will find the hypergranulosis the normal thickness around 1 to 3 layers here it is more than 7 layers in thickness so hypergranulosis noted in the itchy conditions best seen in the lichen planus and now you can see that there is no granular layer there is no keratinocyte with the dark blue granules and its function as we already discussed is mainly to extrude the nucleus because granular layer is absent there is no extrusion so we are able to see the para keratosis nuclei within the corneal layer and remember this occurs mainly in the rapidly proliferative conditions like in psoriasis because there will be proliferation here at the basal level and this will start pushing very quickly pushing very quickly not having time to acquire the different functions so in that way they do not acquire the granules finally causing the para keratosis so absence of granular layer definitely must be documented another important finding to see in the granular layer in the left side picture you can see there are clear spaces around the nuclei even within the upper spinous layer also you can see clear spaces around the nuclei 
pilocytic change, characteristic of verruca. So when you look at the granular layer, first say whether papillomatosis is present or not, then hypergranulosis or absence of granular layer, then look for pilocytic change. Now we move on to the acellular layers, that is the thick, here you can see the thick corneal layer. So definitely this can be called as hyperkeratosis. But before considering that as abnormal, please look at the site of the biopsy because this much of thick keratin can be noted in the acral skin. Palm and sole biopsy, you can see the hyperkeratosis. So that is definitely a normal thing in those areas. In addition, if you see, there is uh, another pale pink area beneath the thick keratin and above the granular layer. That is the stratum lucidum, mainly noted in the acral areas and also in conditions where there is chronic stress and continuous rubbing. So stratum lucidum noted mainly in the stressful conditions and the rubbing areas. Now, if you see such type of thick keratin in areas other than palms and soles, yes, definitely it has to be documented, it can be called hyperkeratosis. But in addition, in this picture, you can see the hair follicles. So this is looking like an acral skin, but with hair follicles. This is called hairy palm sign. Characteristic of lichen simplex chronicus or prorigo nodularis. Remember that lichen simplex chronicus cannot be differentiated from prorigo nodularis under microscopy. They both are same. Now here, there is basal layer. There are keratinocytes within the spinous layer, but no granular layer. There is no dark blue dark blue coarse granularity, parakeratosis is there. But please do remember oral mucosa, any mucosal biopsy bit will not have keratin. There won't be any granularity. So obviously you need to look for the site of the biopsy. The epidermis is over. Now we focus on the dermis, the pink collagen structure. Dermis made up of mainly collagen and it stains pink. And there are two types of dermis. One is in between the reti ridges, this area with thin fibers, that is the papillary dermis. Another is beneath the reti ridges, having thick collagen bundles. Now its main function, the papillary dermis main function is providing nourishment to epidermis. Until now, I did not say anything about the vessels within the epidermis. Epidermis is an avascular structure. The nourishment comes from the papillary dermal vessels. And the fibers, they are thin within the papillary dermis, sorry. Here you can appreciate the thin fibers, which are pale pink and thick fibers and large stout bundles. And also we can identify these elongated blue nuclei. Blue means nucleus, done. Small sized, of course, not everything, but small sized elongated structures, blue nucleus. Collagen is synthesized by fibroblasts. So these are all the fibroblasts focus on the reticular collagen bundles, they are a little bit thicker, thick reticular collagen bundles. Within the dermis, now you identified the collagen, we'll focus on the other structures, starting with blood vessel. Now, this is a blood vessel, a luminal structure, it has a space within it, luminal structure with flattened blue endothelial nuclei. So thin lining, flattened nuclei and a luminal structure you need to think of a blood vessel. And you can also see another blood vessel here, small luminal structure with flattened blue nuclei, another vessel. So all luminal structures, first think of blood vessel. Uh, wait a minute. Look at this picture. I said dermis is made up of collagen and it has to be pink in color. Here it's not at all pink. It's not isnophilic, it's grayish. So some damage has occurred. This is a classic case of solar elastosis. So just by knowing that uh, collagen should be in pink color, you can make the diagnosis of solar elastosis, which is gray in color, commonly noted in all the skin biopsies, which are sun exposed in the elderly age group. Dermis, collagen you identified, appreciated, mm -hmm. and vessels. Now we'll see the other structures. What else can we see? Sweat ducts, eccrine, as well as apocrine sweat ducts, and the pilosebaceous unit. Let us start with the pilosebaceous unit. Hair follicle with sebaceous gland and erector pilae muscle. But uh, you need to understand that they may not appear together in a skin biopsy because their 
placement depends on the sectioning or depends on the level of sectioning mainly and you can see here solid structures blood vessel i said luminal structure with thin lining here these are solid structures pink structures solid pink structure with elongated nuclei within it and look at the background collagen color it is pale pink and these erector myelae muscles are showing dark pink so dark pink solid structures think of erector myelae muscles and look at this longitudinal structure longitudinal structure definitely one option hair follicle with the brown color hazy transparent hair shaft this is the brown color hazy and transparent and if you see the hair shaft done the surrounding area is the follicular epithelium now focus this is the lowermost part which is little bit white in color and the upper part the lining epithelium is looking just like epidermis so this area which is just looking like epidermis is the infundibular part and this white area is the suprabulbar region and this is the lowermost part if you focus on this outer cells they are columnar in shape usually in the columnar epithelium nuclei are placed at the towards the basement membrane but here the nuclei are away from the basement membrane this is called as the piano keys appearance noted in the root sheath of the hair follicle lower side suprabulbar region and this is the most important area to be identified the bulbar region wherein you can see the dermal papillae part of the dermis with the pigmented matrix cells if you see inflammation around this bulbar region you need to think of alopecia areata in a scalp biopsy in this biopsy there are so many hair follicles then you need to identify the site of biopsy with this microscopic picture this is from a scalp site coming to the clear cells within the dermis clear but little bit foamy in nature not so clear and centrally placed nuclei these are all the sebaceous glands so you identified erector pile muscles dark pink solid stout structures and hair follicles longitudinal structure with brown colored hair shaft within it and sebaceous glands these three together constitute pilo sebaceous unit now look at the other clear cells adipocytes within the subcutis these are also clear but there is nothing within it but in sebocytes you will see little bit of foamy nature with centrally placed nucleus subcutis the peripherally placed elongated nuclei and other structures sweat ducts sweat duct these the below ones are the sweat ducts these are also luminal structures but with epithelial lining not the flat end just like in blood vessel this upper one is a blood vessel with a fibrous connective tissue around it that is also collagen so pink color but look at the flat end nuclei endothelial nuclei so luminal structure with flat end nuclei think of a vessel luminal structures with thick or two layered epithelial nuclei then think of a sweat ducts these are all eccrine sweat ducts now another luminal structure <coughs> sorry another luminal structure with lined by large pink colored cells with apical protrusions towards the lumen can you appreciate these apical protrusions follow the cursor these are all the protrusions towards the lumen decapitation secretions noted in apocrine glands so large cells pink cytoplasm with apical snouting characteristic of apocrine glands look at the eccrine sweat ducts they do not have the apical snouting or the protrusions but in sweat glands they have the apical protrusions now what's the importance you need to again identify the site of biopsy by looking at the apocrine glands is this from axilla groin or nipple because apocrine glands are normally located in those areas but this picture is taken from the biopsy of forearm not forearm sorry forehead area in addition so th these are ectopic apocrine glands that is the first finding you need to write down ectopic apocrine glands are noted because this is the biopsy from forehead in addition we identified numerous sebaceous glands 
ectopic apocrine glands with numerous sebaceous glands and having this clinical picture this is a classic case of nevus sebaceous so it is always important to identify the areas where the glands are located normally and another solid pink structure but focus on these two solid structures again they have elongated nuclei initially i said solid pink structure elongated nuclei means you need to think of erector pili muscle but those muscles they are dark pinker here compare this color with the background collagen they are pale pink in color so these are all nerve twigs dark pink solid structure erector pili muscle pale pink solid structure nerve twigs so the dermis is over we move on to the subcutis the easiest area to identify there is nothing to see here just a white light but focus carefully they are arranged in lobules this clustering of adipocytes and you focus on this thin lines pink lines collagen these lobules are separated by thin fibrous septae so this is the septa and this is one lobule here you can see one lobule another lobule third one fourth one fifth one so this is normal subcutis with thin fibrous septa now if that septa is thickened here it is thickened these three lobules are separated by thick fibrous septa then you need to think of septal panniculitis commonly seen in erythema nodosum and if the lobules are being infiltrated with the cells then you need to think of lobular panniculitis best exemplified by erythema indurateum so when you look at subcutis identify the fibrous septa whether it is thickened think of uh, septal panniculitis but remember there won't be exclusive septal or exclusive lobular both the areas will be inflamed but we need to mention predominantly predominantly septal panniculitis is noted and here also we see there is little bit of thickening of the fibrous septa we mention predominantly lobules are involved so we say predominantly lobular panniculitis is seen again look closely these are the clear adipocytes with elongated nuclei at the periphery compare with the sebaceous glands so two types of clear cells one is very clear adipocytes and the other one is foamy in nature so sebocytes we finished with the normal histological structures what we see in the skin biopsy now we move on to the little bit of pathology so first we start identifying the inflammatory cells we begin with lymphocytes lymphocytes the nucleus will be blue and there won't be any cytoplasm just like dots like this picture see the lymphocytes within the biopsy just dots round or oval shaped blue dots then you can say yes there is lymphocytic infiltration and look at these cells they are having little bit of pink cytoplasm all these cells are having little bit of cytoplasm they look like lymphocytes but with cytoplasm focus on these two cells with cytoplasm and this cytoplasm is to one side here also you can appreciate the cytoplasm to one side these are plasma cells so lymphocyte without cytoplasm plasma cells with cytoplasm to one side now mast cells centrally placed nucleus so easy to identify and the classically described as having fried egg appearance and you can make only one diagnosis when they are seen in numerous number i mean abundant number that is cutaneous mastocytosis so more mast cells are noted means it is a classic for cutaneous mastocytosis look at these inflammatory cells bright red appearance with nuclei within it bright red with nuclei within it here it can be called as spectacle shaped so eosinophils they look at you i mean by the, the moment you see a slide with eosinophils you will first make out eosinophils only but there are more in number in this picture when you see this much of number you need to look for other cells as well focus on this nucleus there is one single line can you appreciate that elongated pale blue nucleus with single line 
that is considered as the coffee bean shaped nucleus that is the appearance coffee bean shaped nuclei they are langerhans cells so this is a case of langerhans cell histiocytosis if you see a, a skin biopsy from a child with so many eosinophils then definitely you need to identify these langerhans cells look at these inflammatory cells there is blue color distributed everywhere but they are not looking like lymphocytes they do not have any cytoplasm like plasma cell not even mast cells they are not bright red like eosinophils they are a little bit clumsy like the ants these are all neutrophils when you see some irregular clumsy structure consider it as neutrophil in addition focus on this dark area this is a luminal structure that is a vessel but it has dark pink appearance that is a necrosis fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel walls so the necrosis is always dark pinker amorphous in nature but dark pinker no shape nothing but this is the viable collagen this is the necrotic vessel wall a classic case of cutaneous small vessel neutrophilic vasculitis and finally this uh, rbcs they do not have any nucleus so you will see only red dots if you see only blue dots lymphocytes only red dots they are all rbcs extravasation of rbcs important to identify pteriasis rosea another interesting inflammatory cell focus on the top right corner here these are dots dark blue dots lymphocytes these are not round or oval in shape they are elongated predominantly elongated pale blue nucleus this is pale this is dark these are definitely lymphocytes but these are elongated pale blue these are all histiocytes this is a granuloma coming to the largest inflammatory cell in the biopsy jain cell largest peripherally arranged langhans type of jain cell haphazardly arranged nuclei foreign body type of jain cells also look at this right corner the dark blue lymphocyte and here you appreciate the histiocytes these are all histiocytes dark blue pale blue and the shape now that we completed all the inflammatory cells i just wanted to revise the normal dermal structures once again within the dermis when you see the slide within the dermis appreciate the papillary and reticular dermis thick collagen and longitudinal structure hair follicle with the central space or the space will be filled with brown colored hair shaft and clear foamy cells these are all sebaceous glands and the solid pink structures dark pink compared to the background collagen erector pili muscles and another solid pink structure pale pink these are nerve twigs and luminal structures thin lining whether it is small lumen or big lumen thin lining means it's a vessel and if you see thick lining with rounded nuclei then those are sweat ducts these are eccrine sweat ducts and if you see within the lumen any protrusions and large pink cytoplasm think of epocrine glands and the areas are axilla groin if seen other areas definitely they have to be documented as ectopic epocrine glands so that is the normal skin histology when you understand the normal histology identifying abnormal pathology becomes easier now look at this case when you know that this is normal you can easily say that this is an abnormal slide the superficial dermis is busy as well as the deep dermis is busy let us look at the approach how to approach when you look at skin biopsy slide first of all keep the clinical history aside focus only on the slide to avoid bias and try to identify the site if you see hyperkeratosis you need to think okay this is from an acral site probably if only parakeratosis think of mucosa right then look at the area predominantly involved is it epidermis or superficial dermis or deep dermis or subcutis then try to identify the uh, reaction pattern we have many reaction patterns and then make a provisional histological diagnosis after that 
you need to look at the clinical history and come to a final diagnosis. Now, these are all the reaction patterns which we will uh, uh, look after one by one with the cases. Now, the first one is uh, psoriasis from hyperplasia. From a case of psoriasis, when you say psoriasis from hyperplasia, it means there will be regular elongation of reti ridges. When you draw a line touching all the tips of the reti ridges, they will be fell in a straight line. So if you see any condition with such a straight line of uh, uh, connecting all the tips of reti ridges, that is psoriasis from hyperplasia, best seen in psoriasis. And in this case, there is also parakeratosis. The next case is also having fairly regular elongation of reti ridges, but there is one problem. These keratinocytes are closely placed together. And they are also haphazardly arranged closely placed and haphazardly arranged. They are not typical. They are atypical keratinocytes. This is a case of Bowen's disease, squamosal carcinoma in situ, which has atypical keratinocytes. For comparison's sake, look at the typical keratinocytes. This is no, uh, from a normal case, non-malignant case. You can see only acanthosis. These are the typical keratinocytes. Again, look at the atypical keratinocytes. I think you can easily identify the atypical now, Bowen's disease. Coming to the easiest reaction pattern, if you see space within the skin biopsy slide, then you need to think of vesiclobullous reaction pattern. But identify the location where the space is seen. Here, there is corneal layer. Beneath that, there is space, but filled with pink serum. That pink color is because of the serum. The, if there is clear space, you will see white color like this with the serum and neutrophils. Okay, so this is a subcorneal blister. You need to think of pemphigus foliaceous. We'll look at another case in a similar fashion. Corneal layer with space filled with serum and neutrophils. Subcorneal blister means immediately we'll think of pemphigus foliaceous. Though this is an easiest reaction pattern, it is difficult to confirm. Why? Because we need to confirm with immunofluorescence. You need to have a cryostat and also a fluorescent microscope. And then see under that microscope wherein you can see the fishnet pattern of IgG and C3. Now, if the IF is negative with subcorneal blistering appearance, then you need to think of subcorneal pustular dermatosis, pustular psoriasis, and even bullous dermatophytosis as well as bullous impetigo. So it is very difficult to confirm, but easy to recognize on HME. Another vesiclobullous reaction pattern. Here the uh, space is above the basal layer. The basal keratinocytes are attached to the dermis. So this is at the level of uh, above the basal layer. So supra basal blistering, a classic case of pemphigus vulgaris with fishnet pattern showing IgG and C3 C deposition. And another spacious disorder, this is at the level of subabdominal space. So subabdominal blister with isnophils, you need to think of first differential would be bullous pemphigoid. So linear pattern along the epidermal basement membrane, bright green appearance. And salt split skin, if you do, then you will have this appearance. This is the blister, salt split induced blister. And the positivity is noted along the roof of the blister. Floor is negative. So exclusive roof is in favor of bullous pemphigoid. And when you see the C3C, there is a line along the epidermal basement membrane. And under salt split immunofluorescence, you can see positivity on the roof as well as on the floor. So exclusive roof favors bullous pemphigoid. Roof and floor together also favors bullous pemphigoid. If it is only exclusive floor, then you need to think of epidermolysis bullosa equista. Ah, this is the lichenoid reaction pattern. We cannot even appreciate the basal layer. It is half I mean, not half set, it is blur, completely blur. This is a case of lichen planus. The lymphocytes are trying to engulf the basal keratinocytes. And you ought to find the necrotic keratinocytes. Again, necrosis means dark pink. It is in the collagen amorphous dark pink and if it is within the cell necrosis means dark pink civety bodies these are called civety bodies and 
look at this biopsy you can see the blue epidermis pink collagen but you can see some dark pink areas here dark pink areas this is a last reaction pattern a classic case of neutrophilic vasculitis with the fibrinoid necrosis of the basal walls showing so many neutrophils and to conclude under the skin biopsy slide you will see mainly epidermis dermis and subcutis and three structures but only two colors pink and blue color and after this lecture try to identify any slide and please appreciate all the normal structures you make the exercise like this starting from epidermis and identify all the four layers lucidum you will see only occasionally but corneum granulosum spinosum and basalis and within the dermis again first longitudinal hair follicle then two solid structures erector pilemazil and pale pink narutwix and two luminal structures one thin lining flattened nuclei blood vessel and thick lining rounded epithelial nuclei sweat ducts afterwards you can identify the clear sebaceous glands and then go to subcutis focus on the thin fibrous septa and you can make out lobular predominantly lobular or septal panniculitis thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Sudhir, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, literally, you have taken us through the from basic to you know immunofluorescence assay, the basic structure of the skin, what are the pathological different different condition and picture in those pathological conditions. It was a wonderful presentation. Even you have touched on the aspect of how to approach a slide, like when you want to examine any slide, how to approach that slide exactly. Uh, so step by step. So it was very important uh, thing to understand the basics of the you know skin layer and which exactly in which skin layer which pathology we should see and identify the color difference uh, when you stay see the stain slide. So I believe uh, the one who are listening are very much clear with all those concepts now. So if anyone have any question, they can chat, uh, type in the chat box. We, we would like to take those questions. But as of now, I can't see any question because the session was so wonderful that I don't think anyone has any doubt now. So just uh, uh, for the uh, you know, discussion sake, uh, you are, I just want to have your opinion on the history taking. Whenever you receive any slides and you, uh, in the approach for a slide, you said the history should not be seen at first when you receive any sample. It should be seen or you should uh, take the history later on. So uh, what do you think about the, uh, how much important is the history taking when you want to give some report to any clinician at which stage it should be taken? Any opinion you want to comment, Dr. Sudhir? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, when it comes to dermatopathology, uh, as I already mentioned, we first make a provisional histological diagnosis. But the yeah. thing is, it has to be correlated clinically. Luckily, all the dermatologists who send us the biopsies, they gave one page history to me. So I don't have any problem with that and uh, as many differentials as possible. And even after looking at the history correlating with them, uh, I'm not a clinical dermatologist, so it's difficult for me uh, to correlate completely. So I will call for every case, I will talk to the dermatologist. Mm -hmm. I will tell him the, my provisional histological diagnosis. Then he will also say whether it is fitting into his clinical differential. Then we'll match it and give a diagnosis. But alone looking at the slide, you cannot make a complete dermatopathological diagnosis because it comes under non-neoplastic pathology. Neoplastic pathology is different. For neoplastic pathology, yes, microscopic appearance is important. Though there are certain uh, situations wherein you need to know the history of radiotherapy because it gives atypical appearance. 90% uh, of the times, neoplastic pathology can be diagnosed under the microscope, but non-neoplastic pathology like dermatopathology it has to be correlated clinically. It's always better to discuss with the treating dermatologist. That's the thing. Yeah, so uh, discussing with the you know dermatologist is very important because not just looking at a slide, we can't reach at a definitive diagnosis because there might be so many uh, you know a microscopic picture which overlap each other. So you know the uh, dermatologist help us to you know exactly reach exact diagnosis so that we can treat a patient on those terms so very wonderful session dr sudhir and uh, for now there are no question 
so it was very informative uh, and uh, very good session so thanks a lot for such a uh, explaining such a basics of dermatopathology thanks a lot dr sid thank you thank you so much